Hey guys, Barty Toto here with Disrupt Your Brand. And today I am like honored, really, really honored to interview Rudy Sarzo, who is the basis now for Quiet Riot. You went back after 18 years. And of course, I know you're going to tell us about that. He has been in Ozzy Osbourne, if I make a mistake, Blue Oyster Cult, Quiet Riot. You've played for many, many different bands and you are an author as well. And one of the reasons that I wanted to interview Rudy and he's in my eyes stands out from everyone else is he has a passion and a love for helping others, also animals and does things differently than most, in my opinion, musicians do on the internet. And also the fact that, you know, you are, your brother is also a musician. And I saw the photo of your mom yesterday on Instagram, which is amazing. And I think it's just your background coming from Cuba to America. Um, it's just, I mean, what you've accomplished is just breathtaking, you know? Well, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, it's a uh, go. Well Definitely, uh, the last thing you mentioned, the photo with my mom is such a blessing to have her with living with, uh, she lives with us. We, uh, we picked her up in Miami about three months ago and we brought her home with us with my wife, Rebecca and Willow. And, and, and she's, uh, she's brought so much joy into her family, you know, having her with us. And, um, you know, I, yeah, I, you know, when you say coming from Cuba, the first thing that comes to mind is the, the reason why we're here, you know, in the United States. And that was because of uh, <laughs> communism, communism, you know, if you have the choice to live in, to make you, to own your, everything you work for, you own, mm -hmm. you know, even, e even if you're paying a mortgage, yes, you own this. You're just paying a mortgage someday you're going to stop paying the mortgage you know so you in reality you own it you know it's yours it's your responsibility the government does it you know and uh you know to to be able to make choices like we did especially back in the 60s when we first arrived here you know there, it seemed like there was less of a government presence than there is today because of course now we have social media and you know, certain certain groups use social media to to express their 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 political beliefs. Which, you know, I grew up in an era that I only heard about politics when we turn on the news, and it was you know Huntley Brinkley, Brinkley report and you know things like that. You know, for one hour I listened to it, I went okay. You know, and and I was I was very I became aware of politics when I was young because of communism. Mm -hmm. Communism all of a sudden is like, oh, the government can really, really get in your life and take certain things away from you. So I've always kept an eye on that, <laughs> you know, ever since I was a child. But I, I'm not a politician. You know, I'm a musician. I'm the, I think I'm the furthest thing away from, from, from politics, you know. But nowadays, like I mentioned, you know, you, you just can't get, get away from it. So it's, it's, it's a thing that... Yes, it's I, I am reminded of why, why I'm here, why is my family here, why did we give up everything that we had, especially for the sacrifices that my parents made. They were in their 30s when they just took up and left. We left the apartment that we lived in Havana, just like we were going out for the weekend for many reasons. One of them is you could not at that time in 1961 uh, give away to your relatives your belongings. Because again, it was part of the government owned that, you know. And so when we left and we, uh, we uh, just to make a short, shorten the story, get to the point, uh, when we arrived in the United States, we applied for political asylum. Uh, we became Cuban refugee status. Before that, we had to wait about a year and a half to get visas and somebody to claim us from the United States and, you know, to come into the country legally because you they, you were not even being allowed to leave if you didn't have Cuba, if you didn't have that those documents and things like that. So it's there was a lot of sacrifices that my parents made, you know, incredible sacrifices. And and we, uh, my brother and I, we, uh, we benefit from it. And, you know, by living in the United States, being raised here. And 
So we never forget, you know, where we came from, of course, you know. I think that's amazing. How did you get into music? Was your father a musician or did you just have a, a gift that you had in your heart to play bass or where did it all start for you? Uh, well, I think the gift of music is something that, that, you know, we all have that inside of us, you know, in some way or other, you know, we have certain talents when it comes to music, you know, and I think the, the biggest gift about music is the appreciation, which is, I've, I've been a fan of music longer before I've been a, been a professional musician. Mm -hmm. You know, I would say I've been a fan of music all my life, ever since I was a baby. But I've been a professional musician really for 41 years when I started playing with the Ozzy Osbourne. Professional, I mean, if you're really making a living from it. Yeah. You know? Prior to that, yeah, I was, I was uh, surviving, basically. Uh, but musically, uh, no, there was nobody really in the family. Uh, we got into it. You know, we saw my brother and I, we saw the Beatles in 1964 wow. that night with that, my generation, that was kind of like the spark that ignited this music revolution as we have it today. You know, so many musicians making, actually making music and, and, and making the soundtrack of our lives, you know, and that, that was about it. I, I was just, I, I was just impressed. I was just impressed on how much. Uh, it was basically the girls screaming for the Beatles. That that was it. It wasn't really about you know how great they sounded, how cool you know their music was or their no. It was like wait a minute when the camera panned to the girls, it was oh, like geez. it was like I want that. Oh, okay. Whatever it is, I, <laughs> and and they and they they got instruments and the girls scream. That that was <laughs> it's a very simple message, you know. I was 13 years old, you know, some oh, that's funny. fat Cuban little kid living in West New York, New Jersey. And I was invisible at that moment, you know, uh. in school, I was invisible completely, you know, to girls. So, you know, being in a band and also it, it, it just brought the cultures together. Uh, I, I lived in, I, I was born in Havana. So my first 10 years of my life, I, I live in amongst diversity, urban diversity in Havana. You know, it was, everybody lived, coexisted together, you know, whether it was the Chinese who had come over from, from, from China, escaping communism, and they wind up in Cuba, and then, then they have to leave, you know, later on. But, you know, we have a lot of Chinese in, in our culture. The food, Chinese food is big and certain other things. And then you had the... Uh, uh, the Polish Jewish uh, refugees during World War II migrated to to uh, to Cuba. You know, so we had the Jewish neighborhoods, but then again, you know, we were all co mingling, you know, coexisting, and and all the different cultures, and you know, so it was an urban experience, but it's a coexisting urban experience, you know, and then. When I came to Miami, that was not really as much urban. That was still 1961 Miami, which was basically, there was nobody there. You know, it was still a, a vacation resort, Miami Beach area and stuff, and not a whole lot of industry, which is the reason why my parents were, were, uh, were, were invited yeah. <laughs> to relocate. Invited is kind of like saying, well, you can stay here and not get a job, but if you want to work, you have to go somewhere else because we don't have enough work for, for all the influx of Cubans that were coming in weekly. And I'm talking about flights, yeah. not walking across the border. We're talking about if there was five flights coming in from Havana to, to Miami, you know, like one daily, let's say, seven flights, right? That's about 200 people. That's about if the whole plane as for political asylum, that would be about four, you know, 1,400 people. It was a slow build, but that added up daily. Oh, yeah. You know, daily. So it was, it got to a point that, you know, there's not enough jobs here. So we're going to have to like take you somewhere else. And we wound up in West New York, New Jersey, you know, and that, that was urban. That was very urban. For the first time, I, I experienced 
cultural separation. Even in school, you have like your you have your 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 you know the uh, the Irish neighborhood and the Italian neighborhood, and German neighborhood, and very few Latinos at that time there. Most of the Latinos were in the Bronx at that time in 1963. 1963. So and you grew up in New Jersey. I grew up in New Jersey, in 19, yeah, from 63 to 66, so about four years up there. And then where uh, did you go after New Jersey? Back to Miami. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, but but what, what happened was musically, the day after the Beatles played, all mm -hmm. of a sudden, kids who would not talk to each other in school because they were from different neighborhoods, they started, hey, because this this was the the uh, the code was if you comb your hair forward you were yeah. impacted by the beatles because prior to that show everybody come come their hair back so you're like, cool like a trend a fad it was like you're in you're in that tribe uh -huh. the beetle tribe you know so how the heck your first band correct me if i'm wrong was with ozzy how did you meet him and how did you get involved in bass playing yeah. and, you know yeah yeah, there's a lot of yada 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 in between what I what I just of finished course. talking about watching the Beatles and playing with Ozzy. So that's a lot of stuff that happened. Yeah, of course it did. But but to give you the yada yada version of it, uh, You're so funny. Well, I'm, I'm a big Seinfeld fan. I mean, I can just pinpoint anything to sign in Seinfeld to like things that happen in every everyday <laughs> life because that's what the show is about. That's you know? great. Yeah. So. Uh, uh well i was playing with choir riot in 1978 uh with with randy rhodes and kevin and drew Forsyth and and randy joined uh ozzy yada 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 yeah uh, they, okay. <laughs> two years later, they uh they needed a bass player so randy recommended me so this that's is 1981 awesome. 41 years ago yeah wow that was, yeah. that's amazing yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and you, I mean, you were with them for how many years? Well, this is what happened. Uh, uh, two tours, the Blizzard of Oz American Tour, uh, or uh, Northern, uh, North American Tour, because we also tour Canada, you know, so I don't want to leave Canada out. We did one show in England and for that tour, the Blizzard of Oz Tour, okay. North America. And then since the Diary of a Madman record was already recorded before Tommy Aldrich and I joined the band, we we only took like a month off in between tours. And then we continued, like in October, uh, touring with Ozzy, but this time for the Diary of a Madman tour. We started off in the UK and in Europe. And then by December 31st, no, actually, December 30th at the Cow Palace in San Francisco, we began the Diary of Mimetman tour, North American tour, you know. So uh, we did a lot of touring within that. I was there for two tours, and there was a lot of touring going on. And we, we spent a lot of time together. Yeah. And then after that, so what years were you with Quiet Riot? Now, I know that you've recently, mm -hmm. it was at the beginning of, mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong, the end of 2021 or beginning of 2022 that you joined back with Quiet Riot. Well, uh, what made it challenging to actually pinpoint the date is the fact that we had a pandemic and nobody was touring. Oh, yeah. I mean, so, people still so, ask me what today is, and I'm like, yeah. I don't even know. I get my days. Yeah. Still. Yeah. Yeah. So you can make a lot of plans during a pandemic, but you have to wait yes. <laughs> until you can actually manifest those plans in your head, you know, make them exactly, you know, make them make them happen. Uh, so uh, to answer your question fully, I joined in 1978. 79, the band broke up when Randy left to join Ozzy. And then uh, Quiet Riot ceased to exist until the metal health version of Quiet Riot. Um, that's the, you know, it's the, the metal health record, you know, 
And that would be with Frankie Benali, Carlos Cavazzo, Kevin DeGroa, and myself. And uh, that began, I actually became an official member. Actually, Quiet Riot became officially Quiet Riot in 1982 when we signed the record deal, late 1982. And uh, I got to play on the record except for two songs that as credited on the back cover from day one, uh, Chuck Wright, who was actually playing with Kevin in, the, in a band that prior to Quiet Riot was, was called Dubro, which was Kevin's band. I played in Dubro right, right up until I joined Ozzy, and then Chuck Wright came in after that. Yeah. It's, I was reading your story, you know, the last time I saw Frankie was at the Whiskey A Go Go for a um, Ultimate Jam Night, I think mm. it was 2019, and then I know he passed in, what was it, 2020, and I know that I was reading the story about his wife, and his wish was for you to be back in mm. Quiet Riot. Mm. I read that somewhere, and mm. I was going to ask you about that. I know that you were very close with Frankie. You were, you know, by mm. his side and so forth before he passed on. He he was an amazing man, uh, amazing heart. Um, yeah. And you know, I was uh, fortunate to get to know him and had a long conversation with him. Um, I remember up in the loft at the Whiskey A Go-Go. And, you know, what was your reasoning for going back to Quiet Riot? I mean, the people that, the original um, members, Carlos and yourself, um, you know, I love Carlos Cavazzo and yourself, you know, are very giving kind people. And that's why I said, you know, not to forget where you came from because many people, you know, they get the fame and around people and they forget mm -hmm. where they came from. And, I commend you for your humbleness and, you know, and the fact that on another note, how you love dogs and how you, um, you know, don't have a problem speaking what you support and feel about. And a lot of people are afraid of what people think and you're not. And I think that's great. But um, I guess my question, like I said, was, you know, what made you go back to Quiet Riot? Um, was it Frank, you know, his request or that you just wanted to after yeah. eight years? Yeah, well, I mean, as, uh, regarding Frankie, I've known this year marks 50 years that I have met him. Wow. 50 years. So by the time we recorded Metal Health, Frankie and I, we had been playing together for 10 years on and off. We have been living together, traveling the country together in, in co cover bands back in the 70s, uh, living uh, based out of Chicago, in addition to Florida, Bill, you know, Florida, South Florida, where we started playing. And then we moved to LA and we lived together in LA and we were in bands in and out. And, and to actually walk into the studio to initially just record one song as a tribute to Randy Rose, which is a song that Kevin DeBro wrote for Randy when Randy left. My ride to Joan Ozzy was called Thunderbird. And I used to play that song with Kevin in, uh, in du when I was a member of Dubrow and I was living with Kevin. So I knew the song. I, I mean, I came up with the bass part. So, you know, so I walk in the room and there's Frankie and of course, Kevin, who I just been playing with him in Dubrow and Choir Riot. And Carlos, I, I, we, we, we had done some shows together with his band Snow and Quiet Riot, but we really, you know, we weren't socializing, you know, so that was kind of like my first time that I met him and, and so on. So a few months before that, going in the studio to record Thunderbird, Randy had passed away in March 19, 1982. And that took away the joy of playing music for me. I did not realize exactly, I couldn't pinpoint it. I just knew that it was this vast emotion that I could not suppress, even though I tried really hard, no matter how much I suppressed his loss, it was, it, it was always there, you know, on stage, especially you walk on stage and everything is the same, except Randy's not there. That's hard. So it's like, 
nothing is the same, really. <laughs> you know, it's not there. You know, a huge, 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 huge pass part of that was missing, Randy. And so now I can actually look back at it and say, okay, this is what actually happened. You know, Quiet Riot was my first collective consciousness band. And usually it happens when you first start playing together. You find guys or girls, you know, a band, musicians, that you have this collective. It's like, we're going to make it. This is it. I mean, some of the greatest bands in the world had had that at the beginning of their career. Let's say the Beatles in Hamburg. They were, I've seen photos where they lived. It, they lived like in the back of a room where they had two, uh, what do you call that, double beds, you know, like, and they were together all the time. And nothing mattered, but we're going to make it. We're going to make it. This is the band. They, it was not about the girls. It was not about drugs and alcohol or any, any, anything. It was just the band, right? So with Quiet Riot, it was exactly that with Randy Rhodes. It was all about the band. That's what we did. How, how, how can we take this to the next level? We got a fan base and they're really supporting us. But what about the record industry, the ones that signed a check? Those are the ones that we, we must get to next so they can, you know, we can make a record and we can make a living out of doing this, you know, and make this our, our this is it, Quiet Riot, right? So that was Quiet Riot in 1978. 79 and ever since once that band stopped ceased to exist when randy left to join ozzy i could get glimpses of it if i was playing let's say with with with, with kevin i was I, here i am playing with kevin in dubrow and dubrow's and kevin's got that drive still it's all about the music it's not about getting high it's not about, it's not about, the, about the girls it's about the music and i'm in there and say yep I agree with you. It's a continuation of what I was doing with Choir Riot. But not necessarily with the other members in the band that I was playing with at the time in Dubrow. They, in order for them to survive, there were other means that they had to focus on, right? So it was not exactly the same, the same collective consciousness that we had when we had when we had Choir Riot, right? So I I joined Ozzy. And here I am playing with Randy. Again, major part of my collective consciousness with Quiet Riot, right? Randy was all about playing. That's it. That's all he did. You know, it wasn't about getting high. It wasn't about girls. I mean, we didn't have any girls backstage because Sharon would not allow them. <laughs> so it was nothing to do about that. He had a girlfriend, Jody. And at home back in the Burbank, so it was like, how can we make this every single day a better show than one, the one that we played last night? Right. And that was my collective consciousness. Randy, Randy. I would see him backstage warming up and trying new, new things. And because, you know, people listen to, like, let's say the Tribute album, which is Randy playing live with Ozzy. That was recorded in 1981, not even early 1981, not even during the Diary of a Madman tour. I heard Randy on his last show he did. I was on stage next to him. And he had progressed so much from what you hear on that record. And still I get chills when I listen to that record. And his playing, it's electrifying, you know, and he had, he had just moved on to a whole different level musically and then he passed away so once he passed away i lost that consciousness you know yes we all felt that whether it was tommy aldridge or ozzy or even sharon how to make the band better every single day we all did but that consciousness did not go back to my roots with quiet riot you know it's it's uh, every single band that I've been in after Quiet Riot, I always brought with me a degree 
of Choir Riot, a certain amount. How much, how much Choir Riot can I bring in <laughs> to a certain band? How much do you allow me to bring in? Some yeah. bands will say just everything. Some bands say, some bands I, I am aware that I can only bring in so much. You know, I'm gonna blow my nose here. It's okay, I have bad okay. allergies myself. Okay, oh yes. <laughs> I live right, I mean, I live right up the path to the Santa Monica Mountains right here. So I'm on t very, very top of the hill. And oh yeah, this allergies get to me before they get to anybody else down below in the valley. <laughs> so uh, so going back to, to that, I mean, if you look at early Aussie, half of Choir Riot was in that band. Yeah. You know, a band that, that a few months, be, if, about a year before, they, they were you know, a guitar player. Randy Rhodes, who wrote all those songs, you know, became that Hall of Fame guitar player, you know, inducted to the Hall of Fame and was being rejected daily by the music industry in LA before he joined Ozzy. And Ozzy just gave him the freedom to be himself. You know, that's, you know, Randy asked him, say, what do you want me to write? What, what do you want me to be like? And Ozzy said, man, just, just be yourself. Exactly. There you go. You have that. He he did not have that while we were playing together in Quiet Riot, because we were basically trying to please the local music industry, uh, what whatever they because at that time the flavor of, flavor of the day was new wave and punk. Yeah. So if you back were in that, the, yeah, back well back in the late seventies, seventy eight, oh yeah. yeah, and uh, so so yeah, so that that's what Quiet Riot means to me. It means to me. It's my is my my collective consciousness, and you usually get that collective consciousness in in your first band, your garage band. Your guys in the garage, and you, you're in high school, and you're you know you got this vision, and then you graduate from high school, and you grow up, and you go separate ways. In my case, I went back to my garage band because I needed to connect with that collective consciousness once again, because I had lost that. And it's always been about the joy of playing. So 18 years later, you're like, I'm, I, I gotta go back. Well, you can't go back unless you're invited to. Right. And my invitation came, came from Frankie. Yeah. You can't attend the party. Otherwise, you'll be crashing the party yeah, and, and you usually get kicked out. <laughs> I, I wrote that his, his wife and uh, also Frankie wanted you back. Yeah, yeah. It's a, and uh, yeah, and, and what do you do? I mean, this is the first time I'm ever, ever going on stage with an actual mission. A mission, not just a, a desire or, or even a vision. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about a mission. My mission is to celebrate the legacy and the, the legacy of Quiet Riot and the memory of Randy Rose, Kevin DeBro, and Frankie Benali. So every time you go and play on stage, you bring them with you? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, but beyond that, I'm there to celebrate them. It's about them. Yeah. It's that's, about them. Yeah. That's amazing. That is. So are you, you guys are touring uh, the rest of this year, correct? I was looking at some of your tour dates. Are you involved with any other projects? I know that- No, no not, not really, but yeah, with Quiet Riot, it's an open-ended, uh, never-ending tour. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's now, like... <laughs> tell me what made you write the book, um, you know, Off the Rails? Off the Rail, very simple, just to answer the number one question I get asked when I travel around the world, which is, what was it like to play with Randy Rhodes? Yes. And I could never really put it in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. So I figured, because, you know, I'll, I'll be at, at a, a lobby in the hotel and I'm signing some you know, fans, you know, record that he bought. And they go, so what was it like to play with Randy? You know, and you want to share something significant with him. And you do, you tell them a couple. stories and then we walk away and I go like, wow, I should have put that on in a book. And we'll hear from 
take him by the hand and, and get, get him on the road at a time I, I, in music that will never return ever again. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm not being pessimistic. I'm being realistic. It's like the roaring 20s, as far as music goes, you know, having like pianolas and, and, and uh, you know, record phonographs that you have to wind up and stuff like that. That's never coming back. <laughs> people might have that in a museum just to say hey look at what i got an antique you know gramophone or whatever no they ain't coming back so you know anything that we were doing back in the 80s how we tour how we travel how we recorded the consciousness of it not having social media as a distraction and also not having social media as the greatest marketing partner that you could ever have uh, because we didn't have that back then, so we did things differently. You know, Randy Rhodes would have gotten more exposure today than he did 40 years ago because there was no iPhones. Right. People go, oh, how come there's no live footage of Randy? And I go, yes, they're all in my 1981 iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> I got it in my vault, <laughs> yeah. No, we didn't have that technology. And, you know, we, all, we were always aware anytime there was somebody with a, an actual, we're going to video this, this event. Yeah, we were fully aware of everyone that nobody's hiding. The Osbournes are not keeping in a vault footage of Randy Rhodes that they were aware that it was being produced 40 years ago, 41 years ago. No, no, because if that's the case, what the hell are they waiting for to release that footage? No, it just doesn't exist. Now, now there has been footage that was found. Let, let's say in one case, there was a photographer that attended one of our shows. I believe it was the Palladium in New York in 1981. And he had a photo pass, but he also brought with him an eight millimeter camera. So he started taking pictures and he goes, well, screw the pictures. I'm just going to take a video here. So he took the video, went home, put it in a box, and forgot about it. 30 years later, he's going through his box. Well, 40 years later. Yeah, 30 years later. Yeah. He's going through the box, and he finds it. So he contacts the record label, and they included that footage in the re-release of Blizzard and Diary. So, yeah, that was like a big box set. You know, it's in there, Right. Yeah, so there might be cases where something like that happens, but not a professional shoot. That professional shoot that we were scheduled to do with Randy became Speak of the Devil, not the re-recordings of the Black Sabbath songs, but actually the MTV special that we did in Irvine, California, uh, but with Brad Gillis, because by then Randy had passed away. So yeah, there was plans of doing stuff with, with Randy, but he did not live long enough. Yeah, you know, it's funny what you said about a legacy. I want to share something with you. My son is young. He's 27. His girlfriend is 35. Mm -hmm. And her father has passed away. He was in the, a military black ops mm -hmm. helicopter pilot that unfortunately didn't come home one time. Mm -hmm. And she was telling me the other day uh, how he loved Quiet Riot. He would listen to it. And it was like he went to all the concerts and because I had mentioned you to her the other day and she's like, oh, my gosh, I would love to just go to one of his concerts in respects of my father. Like my father would love mm -hmm. to have seen Quiet Riot. Like mm -hmm. she said, growing up because she's 35, she says, that's all I heard about was Quiet Riot mental health, like, you know, because her father passed in 2003, but mm -hmm. it's been almost 20 years but you talk about music and a legacy. Now, this is a 35 year old girl, my son's girlfriend, who's like, oh, I would love to go. Like, I don't know anything about their music, but just because it was my dad and, you know, to listen to that music. And I, I am sharing that story because music goes to the soul. And when you go on stage and I um, don't want to cry, when you go on stage and you say how you are doing it for them, it just, I wanted to share that with you because it's like her going to your concert. She was doing it for her father because of the father's love for music for y'all. Yeah. And so it's amazing how music moves the soul. And I love, I've been to so many concerts and before I, uh, you know, 
started doing branding in the music and entertainment business. And I mean, I love all kinds of music, but you know, what people don't realize is, you know, yeah, it's not about the women or the fans. I mean, it's really about the heart of playing. And, and uh, I think it's great that you give tribute to Kevin, Randy and Frankie, because they were just amazing. You know, I had the honor of meeting Frankie. I didn't have the honor of meeting Kevin or um, Randy, of course, but Frankie was a really great guy. Yeah, and you know, one really great thing that's happening uh, today, today, I mean, right now, the way that the music industry for our genre of music is structured, we, we get to do a lot of package tours, which means that the fans gonna be getting, a, you know, uh, you know what they should for their hard earned money you know uh they're going to be getting a lot of hits we have some uh, tours coming up one of uh, package tours one of them is the uh it's a tour with skid row warrant and either kip winger acoustic or kip winger electric it all depends and then we flip i saw that yeah and uh because uh, their guitar player it's Red Beach. It's uh, touring with a White Snake, so he might not, be, you know, the band might not be able to appear completely, you know. So Kip will go play an acoustic guitar and sing it, which I've seen him do that many times, and it's just electrifying. And and what we do is is really it's a celebration of each other's accomplishments, you know, our bands, and it's a collective uh, celebration of the of the. Consciousness, you know, I know I keep using consciousness, but it's for those out there who get tired of hearing that word, it's actually a, a, a belief system that we had, that we all share. Because, you know, whether you come to, let's say back in the 80s, you were a fan of Skid Row, you're a fan of Quiet Riot, Winger, uh, Warrant, whatever, you know, you all show up, you, you do not know each other, you're standing next to each other in a concert. And you have at least one thing in common that you're here to listen to the music that the band is going to be playing that's a belief system you believe in their music you believe in their message you believe in everything that they do and sometimes what they say you know and to me that is you're sharing that and i i don't want to get a little bit a little bit too out you know i i I, I study quantum physics and I understand energies and frequencies, which is one of my personal personal journeys that I'm that I'm that I'm in on right now, the journey of finding the healing qualities of music because it's all frequency. If we're like 90% water, have you ever seen cymatic experiments? Cymatics is when you take certain frequencies and they actually create what is called sacred geometry. The frequency so imagine if you're if you're either doing that or doing the opposite creating negative frequency which means that the it's it's chaotic it's a chaotic design rather than a fractal what is called sacred geometry because everything is fractal everything is connected and it, it creates like these beautiful designs uh very much like you find them in uh in temples when you go to temples of different denominations, you find fractal designs, you know, well, that is what the frequencies create with liquids or even you take salt, it will do that. Grains. So I actually form. believe that, um, you know, with the law of attraction, you know, what you mm -hmm. think about, um, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. Michael Beckwith, who was in the movie The Secret wrote the four mm -hmm. to two of my books. So mm -hmm. off this interview, I would love to talk to you further about your belief and oh, what sure. you think and yeah. the vibration because I actually yeah. believe in that as well. And yeah. uh, you know, I know that's another story and another topic. So tell me, um, you know, you have you know, Quiet Riot. Of course, mm -hmm. you have Willow, which I said bring Willow on. I love Willow. <laughs> I've I've been like looking at y'all for years um and uh I've met you in several places and uh finally get to interview you I mean the past few years has been like crazy 
So um, as far as what do you have coming up for yourself? I know you're really big into the shelters in the Los Angeles area. And you are, I think that's great how you post for the Carson shelter and, um, you mm -hmm. know, what else, what other hobbies beside your love of dogs that you have that you'd like to share? Because, you know, people see the outer, you know, musician, but people really have a nose problem. I tell people the number one publication in the world is the National Enquirer, but mm -hmm. we don't ask questions and we don't get to know the person. We just see the, the outer part. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to share something about you that I know with your shelters and the stuff that you love. So there's mm -hmm. quantum physics and there's also the love for dogs and the shelters. What else beside Willow? Well, I really don't have any hobbies because to me, hobbies is like collecting stamps or, <laughs> or, or interest, interest. Well, interest is different. Because interest, you can parlay that into a positive, generating a positive outcome. Collecting stamps, you know. But you have the love with, with the shelter, like you're really. Yes, yeah, them. but see, yeah, I agree. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, uh, but that, that's not a hobby. That is. No, that's an interest. That, yeah, it was like breathing. I do it because. I, I don't even realize I'm doing it. I just do it, say, you know, let's say I go on social media and somebody posts. What I do a lot of mostly is sharing the information. Yeah. And I go and, and if something comes up in my feed, oh, there's a uh, puppy available in this shelter here, not necessarily Carson, but it could be any shelter that's in my feed and I share it. That's a part of gratitude. And then, that's gratitude, like you're all about what I tell people is sharing, sending a video DM, making a comment, and you make comments. Most people don't make comments. That is a form of gratitude. That is a form of giving back. And so yeah. even though you're sharing, you're giving back. And that's part of your consciousness. You know? Yeah. But it's not because I consider it to be a different function of, of my daily journey in life. It's part, it's part of the journey. It's part like, of you. Yeah, it's part of who you me. are. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you have anything in the pipeline, or just you think you'll ever retire? <laughs> oh no! no <laughs> it's like somebody asked me, "Will you ever retire?" And I'm like, "I love helping people. I love training people. I love what I do. It's yeah. part of my soul. I will think I always will do this." You know. Well, I mean, I, 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 I've come to terms that at some point. Uh, uh, physically or, or just, you know, the, the, the hardest part of what we do is traveling. Oh, if, you yeah. could, if you could actually put me in a capsule and open up the, you know, kind of like in Star Trek when or whatever, any of these movies, when you travel, you know, across the universes and, and the pod opens up psh, and you kind of like defrost and you, and you're back to normal. If I could do that for the rest of my breathing years, uh yeah i would play forever but that's not gonna that that's not a reality the reality is that my body will decay at some point Jeez. and and my measuring stick is always keith richards and mid jagger as long as they keep going i keep going you know what i mean so okay they're still doing it I up know. there okay <laughs> i mean know. i sit there and i'm like oh my gosh yeah I mean. yeah so it's kind of like, okay, Keith Richards, he kind of looks cool. I, I rather gravitate more towards Mick Jagger. Yeah. You know, I mean, as far as, you know, keeping entertaining, I mean, Keith Richards yeah. can just show up and, and hit yeah. a chord and it's yeah. like, okay, it's great. But Mick, Mick, Mick has got to work harder than Keith because he's got more to live up to. Well, Charlie Watts, he was amazing. I, Charlie Watts was, was the heart and soul of the band. I, 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 I saw them live many times, and I always walked away with that saying, wow, the day that Charlie Watts is not here, I it's know, over. Was, it's over, yeah. you know. But then again, I, under, I completely embrace and understand the responsibility that the Stones have, Mick and Keith, who are, you know, besides Ronnie, Ronnie, Ronnie Wood has been there for a long time, but the original band, you know. Yeah. Of course. Founding members. As long as they're around, they I know the responsibility they have to keep the legacy of the band going and celebrate the memory of those who are not with them anymore, you know, because they passed on. Uh, 
I know because I'm going through it myself. So I, so I completely understand. Going to a Rolling Stones show today is very different than going to one when Charlie was was there because now it, it, it becomes partly a celebration of that generation, their music, but also the memory of Charlie Watts. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like um, I was just with Sammy Hagar in, in Vegas, and he always makes a tribute to Eddie Van Halen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Every time he goes on stage, I was at his birthday party in Vegas, and then yeah. I was with his um, yeah. him on opening night at the Stratosphere. Yeah. And, you know, he always dedicates and says, you know, Eddie's here, and it, it's kind of the same thing. They, they, um, even I've seen him cry on stage where they, you know, do a tribute every show. They never forget Eddie mm -hmm. Van Halen. Yeah. I, and he's got every right to, and it's his responsibility. You yeah. know, I mean, he can't turn his back on the responsibility and the fact that he has a right to do that because he was, he was a huge part of the Van Halen legacy. I, I'm a fan. I'm a fan of his, of his contributions to the band. It was a whole different band. Yeah, it was. You know, he brought something different to it. Not, I'm not saying it was better than Roth. I'm just saying it was different and and and, and quality, really quality. And you know, records. everybody has their ups and downs, and you hear mm -hmm. stories about people not getting along. But at the end of the day, they were family and um, there for each other. You know, oh, sure. Um, Sammy, yeah. like yourself, he is extremely, extremely mm -hmm. humble. And uh, he's like you. He loves dogs. He has a dog himself, a little shit. I know. But I've, uh, met, I've met him both. I, uh, yeah, so it's I, like, uh, <laughs> you know, and um, I, you know, Brian, his manager is amazing, but mm. it's just that, you know, he is ex extremely humble, you know, as far as the fans and so forth. And he really, like yourself, hasn't, and Sean McNabb hasn't mm. forgotten where they came from because, um, you know, I'm not putting y'all on a pedestal, but I just hope that people watching this video, like people have asked me, you know, how do I get to Rudy Sarzo? How do I work with Sammy Hagar? One, I show gratitude, but, you know, asking, it's like, I want to interview people who are disruptors that are making a difference in the world, whether it's music, whether it's quantum physics, whether it's, you know, um, giving back and showing that, you know, there's a lot of people, unfortunately, in the world from the pandemic and so forth that have lost hope or they don't believe that they're ever going to be at this level as a musician or the music industry has changed completely. There's a lot of musicians that I'm friends with that haven't worked for the past three and a half years. And, you know, I remember one person saying, you know, his high was getting on stage and having the people scream his name and he's used to uh, playing in front of the fans and he hasn't done that for three and a half years and had got depressed and it's like you know and then you get to a certain age where you're wondering okay is your voice going to change especially if you're a singer you get nervous about you know how much longer do I have and so forth and it's like you just have to enjoy today and live for the moment and but this is why I do what I do I love you know interviewing people like yourself to just impact and empower other people, whether they're a realtor, whether they're a musician, whether they're a fan, you know, to show, you know, inside the life of someone who I call you a disruptor, but in a very positive way. And, you know, what we've gone over the past hours, you know, where you came from, what your parents sacrificed, you know, where you went, you know, you standing by the side of your friends and making a tribute is huge and you haven't forgotten where you came from. And um, I'm sure it's had its ups and downs. And uh, how did you meet your wife? Uh, I'm curious. She's an amazing woman. Yeah, she is. Uh, I, you know, I believe that we were destined to be together. We just happened to meet at this uh, party in Hollywood. She was there, I was there and we met, but we have, running to each other in the past in clubs and and so on so on. Yeah. yeah but well, never really talked you know yeah well i want to tell people how they can follow you how they can get tickets to quiet riot how they can find out more about what you're doing i know that uh on instagram you're rudy mm -hmm. what dot sarzo it's rudy. actually uh, the reverse for some reason oh, sarzo, okay. sarzo dot rudy 
Sorry yeah. for the bad guys. Yeah. Oh no, it's it's yeah, it's I I it just showed up like that. You know, they say, okay, this is your 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 name. You this know. is your name, yeah. This is it, you know, yeah. <laughs> kind of like how I got Rudy. I was actually Rudolfo and my teacher in uh, uh, public school number five, we just relocated to New, New Jersey, West New York. My first day of school, he starts calling me Rudy. I had I didn't, I wasn't paying attention. I didn't know who he was talking to. And then I look up and I go and he goes, "Yes, you." And I go and I go, "No, Rudolfo, Rudolfo." And, I, and then he goes, "No, you're Rudy from now on." I said, "Okay." <laughs> okay. It's okay. like my Matthew became Matt. Yeah. It's like his name's yeah. Matthew. You know. Yeah. 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 Let's so you have uh sarzo dot rudy on sarzo Instagram. Dot rudy. yeah yeah and, and it's very simple because i i get these messages and i've tried twice to get the blue the little blue mark on instagram that goes over to facebook also if yeah you get accepted i i've been rejected i've been and, rejected like but, 20 times and i'm like yeah. i give them my media and i give my yeah, me too me too and i'm like i've been in yeah. forbes and entrepreneur yeah. like, i don't know what more yeah. you want yeah, yeah, but see, I, I, I really don't care about the mark. What I do care is that there's uh, fake sites with oh. my name on it. And, oh. and I, I always go to the person that's reporting it to me. It's like, yeah, I know. And thank you for letting me know. But but if if you look at the followers, they have what? 200 followers. I got 50,000. Exactly. Just, yeah. it's not me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm not, I'm not going to start a new page all over again. I got this page here. So it's very simple. If now, you do at, you have yeah. a website that people can go to? I stopped having websites because I finally find them that they're not interactive. Exactly. I tell people yeah. Instagram, TikTok, yeah. YouTube. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I'm like, Facebook is dead. YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, like, yeah, or Twitter, but now, as far as people coming to see one of your shows, I yeah. know that you have some in California coming up. I know you have some on the East Coast coming up. We have it all over the place. Yeah, all over the June place. June 4th, I know that you're in California because mm -hmm. um, I was going to talk to you about that on the side. I would mm -hmm. love to surprise my son's girlfriend mm -hmm. and bring her to a show in tribute of her father. Because which, which one is that? Which one is that? Uh, it's June 4th, and I know it's in California. I think it's the whiskey. The whiskey, yes. oh, is, is yes. it the whiskey? It, that is the worst place. Oh, <laughs> because, because it's small. It's very small. I know. I know. I, and I, so there's no there's no guest list. Yeah. So we'll talk on the side about that. Yeah. We'll figure it out. Yeah. But I yeah. would love to bring her for a tribute to her dad because yeah. she's like, like I said, she's 35, but she's like, I just yeah. know my dad listened to Quiet Riot. That that's all I heard growing up. Yeah. And she's like. That's all I heard, like over and over. So it's it's funny how yeah, the influence yeah, are yeah, music. Yeah. yeah. So any other yeah, the, the whiskey get, is or? oh sure. There's a quiet uh quiet riot band website is uh, there's some shows posted, but you know, there's so many shows in, that are being held back as far as announcing them. Uh because we are on a bill with other people and uh and they want, you know, they add their request. Do not, do not announce them yet, you know. And so, yeah, the choir rap band, and uh, yeah, anything. Alex, Alex Grossi, our guitar player, is very. Uh, he takes care of a lot of the uh, posting as far as the dates go, on social media, the choir riot, and, and so on. That's great. I mean, yeah. I really appreciate you. Thank I am, you. I'm Thank very, you so much, Marty. For you and appreciate everything and mm. off this video i would like to talk to you about the some other things that you had mentioned because you and i have the same belief mm. about a lot of things and it's so neat to really get to know you the inside of you and and you know things that probably people didn't even know about randy or or the band and and it's so to bring light to that i like yeah. appreciate your time yeah. and you know taking your time to talk to me and you know everyone else watching this so i'm very grateful for you my and, pleasure uh, birdie my i would pleasure. i can't wait to see willow oh so, yeah Jesus, i know Jesus. your phone's ringing and uh i'll let yeah. you go but thank okay. you so much thank you birdie. god right. bless you, you take care bye-bye